Hello to all the Hubble audience. My name is Fatima Malikipur. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Melbourne, Australia. And I am also a member of Meet the First Author Committee at Hubble. I'm here today for an edition of Meet the First Author with Dr. Jonathan Gustafson, who is also a co-chair of Meet the First Author Committee at Hubble. We will be talking about their paper titled Modeling Changes in Modular Taper Micromechanics Due to Surgeon Assembly Technique in Total Hip Arthroplasty, which was published in the Bone and Joint Journal. Thanks, Jonathan, for making the time to be with us today. Um, yeah, th thank you, Fatima, for having me. Sure. Um, to start with, um, could you tell us a summary of, of your work and how it fits into the big picture, I think a big picture of um, hip implant and arthroplasty? Absolutely. So um, I'm, a, I'm a biomechanist. I, you know, got my training in bioengineering and biomedical engineering. And so I, I work a lot with uh, implant-based technologies and rehabilitation technologies. And so a lot of my work work is very close to kind of the clinicians that we have um, at our institutes. And so I currently work at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago in the United States. And so our surgeons typically come to us with some really pose really interesting clinical questions for us relating to um, implants. And so in this study, what we were really interested in trying to address is this problem associated with total hip replacements where uh, one thing we commonly see is patients come in usually with reports of pain and once they go through imaging techniques and protocols, it's found that they have what are uh, known as these pseudo tumors commonly around the joint. And mm -hmm. so usually that leads to a revision surgeon, a surgery that's necessary where the implants taken out and what they'll commonly find is a lot of corrosion actually around the total hip replacement. And it's found at a location called the, the taper junction. So basically the way that these surgeries are performed commonly in the US is that they involve two separate pieces, a male and fe a female component that are basically assembled intraoperatively together to be able to perform and provide this kind of hip joint center um, mm -hmm. and, and restore that, that hip anatomy. And so what we were interested in addressing is trying to kind of understand some of the problems associated with what could lead to corrosion in that tapered junction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a big problem. And it, it is, yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a big ta problem to tackle. And so um, one way that we, we go about this is we actually develop computer models mm -hmm. uh, to try and replicate um, the assembly mechanics that our surgeons are implementing. Mm. And so we took uh, 20, 29 surgeons at our institute and brought them in and, and essentially applied their uh, preferred technique on a mechanical testing device mm. we had in the lab. And we measured all those forces and we looked at them and then applied those to a computer model that is of the similar implant type. And then what we found is that those uh, assembly habits couldn't actually influence the way that this uh, interface, the taper junction, is being able to be fit together. Okay, so yeah, that's a great achievement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's um, it's definitely a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun to be able to work with a lot of the different personalities that we have amongst our surgeons, and they were all really excited to come in and basically hammer on this uh, mechanical testing jig that we have in our lab. So it was a lot of fun. So you had mechanical testing as well as computational models, right? We did, yeah, for this study. So that was a, a pretty novel component to it because we used uh, that data essentially as input to drive some of these models. Um, so that's something mm. that's a really, really great um, undertaking that we were able to do for this study. Um, so did you so, use any uh, verification or validation of the computational model as well? Or? So that is an excellent point and something that our reviewers basically asked as well, of course. And so the way that we typically verify these is um, indirectly with some of the tapers that we have in our laboratory. So because we work in a hospital, our research lab, we actually have hundreds and hundreds of these implants that our surgeons collect due to revisions. And so we have a great, we have a great implant pathology lab at Rush mm -hmm. that takes all these implants and performs a large amount of analysis on these to look at the corrosion and damage modes and features. And so what we were able to do is take a look at <clears throat> similar, uh, similar implant types that were mm -hmm. taken due to revision. And what we did is we characterized the changes in essentially the deformations that were happening mm -hmm. between our model and what we saw in the lab. 
And so what we ended up finding is that we saw some similar deformations within our model as what we saw within these retrieved implants. Now, again, we weren't able to replicate modes of corrosion, but what we replicated were damage features essentially. So the mm. permanent damage that's happening along this taper yeah. interface when it's being assembled. Mm. Awesome, yeah, that's a great thing. Okay, so we talked about a nice video that you wanted to share with us as well. I guess yeah, we look forward absolutely, to sure. That. I would be happy to share that. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So one of the novel components or aspects of this modeling technique is that we model the micro asperities on the surface of these tapers. And so this is a, a really novel thing that not many groups are doing because it's, it is computationally challenging. But by modeling these micro asperities, we're able to actually better approximate the real contact that's occurring in this interface. And so as you can mm -hmm. see in this video, the left on the left is that female head taper being assembled on that male taper. And this mm -hmm. is a computational simulation showing that. And on the insets, you can see these curved micro grooves. Um, that's what we term them, these micro asperities. And on the far right, if we zoom in just on one of those, you can see a significant amount of flattening that's happening there on that face that essentially increases the real contact area. This is by design. Uh, implant manufacturers, the way they do this is they machine these components to have these essentially micro grooves to try and uh, increase the amount of total contact area by allowing these to compress. What we found in our study is that depending on the way our surgeons are assembling these, if they do it with one hit or multiple strikes, actually influences the amount of deformation that we get here with mm. these micro asperities. Mm. And so mm. what we ended up finding is that when surgeons apply multiple repeated hits, mm -hmm they actually lead to less deformations and less contact pressure, which we believe is a bad thing because it reduces the total interference strength in this, in this mechanical interface. And so ideally, if you can, again, this is, there's a lot more work that needs to be done to show this. Um, again, we've done indirect val verification. We're currently undergoing some direct validation tests with um, some collaborators, but, you know, ideally to get the, the most amount of deformation, one firm, very hard strike is enough to cause the amount of displacement and deformations you need in this interface. Um, those multiple strikes, we were seeing reductions in that, and we believe it's because the material essentially hardens. These are metals, and so right. when you strike yeah. them repeatedly, mm. you start going into some nonlinear um, phases of the exactly. material, mm. and you can get some material hardening, and it basically makes the material harder to deform. Um, so this is just a theory. We're, we're still working on validating all of that, but this was, this was a really interesting finding for us to be able to see that there was a difference in terms of the computational model, whether surgeons applied one hit or multiple hits. Okay, that's awesome. So how far do you think you are from actually giving advice to the surgeons in terms of yeah. which is the best the strategy to assemble and yeah, so that's so in terms of oh, amount of time. So we've done extensive work looking at retrievals, retrieved mm -hmm. implants, and mm -hmm. categor categorizing them and identifying certain features within these implants. You know, we have a range of like 21 different parameters we look at that have to do with the patient age, their weight, um, time in situ, you know, mm -hmm. for this implant, as well as all these characteristics that are implant related. And so far, implant analysis has only been able to predict about 30% of the variability that's due mm. to all of these parameters. So we believe that some of the role is, is the way that these are being assembled. To answer your question, how far away are we? I'd probably still say a few years because we're currently still conducting some validation tests. Mm -hmm. And then the next step, and this is where the biggest challenge is with this research, is that um, it's very difficult in the United States to be able to get funding to do real in vivo testing on actual patients, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. to be able to look at the in vivo loads that are being applied, those are hard to measure. Um, so this is why computational modeling is a really, really great resource for us to be able to explore some of these questions. Mm -hmm. But the key step is for us to get those validated. And that's actually where we're currently yeah. at. That's always a key challenge, I guess, in terms of computational modeling. And it it always of, is. Yeah. Do you think of any animal studies in this case? Or that's yeah. So we've actually started toying around with the idea a little bit because mm -hmm. um, there's obviously more ethical reasons for it. Exactly. Obviously, when you're um, applying these forces in a different animal, 
Mm -hmm. um, you can run into some translatability, right, uh, issues because exactly. the way that you would assemble a hip replacement in, mm -hmm. say, um, I don't know, I'd say either a poor sign or a sheep yeah. or yeah. maybe even a horse. I, yeah. You know, we've actually we had one of our surgeons who uh, put in a total joint replacement in a gorilla. So oh, believe it or not, wow. yeah. No, that that's so, great. That's close. I know, right? In terms of but uh, but that that wasn't really research related. It was just something for one of our local zoos. But it was kind of a neat thing to be associated with yeah. um, at Rush. So it was kind of fun. But regardless, I think there's definitely challenges there. But that's uh, definitely a great idea and a, and a good next step for us to mm. think about for that translatability mm. to the in vivo condition. Oh, beautiful, awesome. And thinking about the future, how does this research actually fit in your own? goal and career. Absolutely. Case. So for me, my biggest goal right now is to, I, I was doing this as part of my postdoc. I'm currently transitioning to a faculty position at oh, Rush. Great. Um, yeah. So this, okay. absolutely. So this obviously led to a nice publication for us and we're currently undergoing some good collaboration, um, some collaborations with some really great people to try and validate these. But the next step for me in my own career is being able to get the expertise to be able to develop these models and make those clinical translations to be able to talk to surgeons mm. and tell them, Absolutely. hey, the way that you do some of these things mm. does make, mm. does influence the outcomes. And so mm. um, that's really the big next step for me too, is figuring out how to tie this all together to that big picture. Beautiful. That's a lot of good news. And <laughs> we definitely look forward to seeing a lot more in this um, very important area of research which is like definitely um helpful for a lot of people and yeah yeah, yeah. of course i mean a lot of people are getting jo joint replacements at younger and younger exactly. ages so they have exactly. to last longer yeah. and that's one of the key key reasons we do this research yeah. yeah great awesome thank you very much jonathan for your time today and uh being with us um yeah we would like to see a lot more from you thanks sounds great thanks fatima i appreciate thank it thank you thank you very much